morning, everybody. Hope you're all having a wonderful morning. Hope your classes are going well and you're finishing strong. And as finals come up, uh, you are more than prepared for them. Uh, that would be my prayer for you. Peyton, people always ask me about my name. Uh, wherever I go, it uh, doesn't matter what church I'm in, uh, the first questions when people shake my hand as, uh, as they leave the building are about my name. And the, usually the first question is, were your parents crazy uh, when they named you? That's usually the first question. So I love to tell stories about my childhood, um, painful stories, which are now funny, uh, but uh, were painful at the time. Um, and uh, I was born in January of 1981. So, uh, Michael Jackson was famous in 1981, but he was famous as the lead of a group, the Jackson Five. So I don't know how all of you are up on music. I'm gonna give you a little music education today. But he was, he was the lead singer of the Jackson Five. Well, in, I was born in January of 81. In November of 1982, Michael Jackson decided to release an album you may have heard of called Thriller as an individual, okay? So uh, my parents named me, but they thought, well, he's the lead of a group, you know, it's not that big a deal. Um, and he released in November of 82, if you're counting the months, that would mean I was almost two years old. Um, and he released Thriller, and my life has been forever changed since. Um, I, I still remember as I was struggling to walk, um, just to, to find my way around forward, that people were asking me to walk backward. Uh, and um, and uh, it was really confusing uh, to me. But, but anyway, I give you that to give you a little bit of placement of where I am in history in terms of my music uh, knowledge and uh, musicality, because uh, music for me is the 90s, okay? I, I was very blessed to skip the 80s I know some of you love that era of music, but I, I do not. <laughs> I was very glad to, uh, to be able to skip that era. But some of you may be familiar with this poster that I have up on the PowerPoint. Does anybody recognize a poster that looks like this? I'm doing this for the millennials because you don't know what, what this is probably. Okay, I, I see some nodding their head. All right. So I, I, I come, when I say come of age, I'm, I come of age 12, 13 years old in the era of alternative music, okay? Back in those days, alternative was called alternative because it was alternative, okay? The mainstream was not what these guys that were doing, uh, like grunge rock that you may be thinking of, Pearl Jam. I was raised in the greatest era of music there ever was and ever will be, okay? And so I still remember uh, coming of age and getting a mail out. I can still see the mail out. And those of you who've received them before, they were in, in envelopes about this size. And they had these little posters in them where you could get CDs for one penny. You could get, uh, this one actually has cassette tapes. And by the way, for you guys, CDs are these round things that you slide in in your cars and they have like albums on them um, and you keep, that you didn't get them from the internet. You know, they were actual uh, hard copies. But you could get up to 10 CDs. I think at the time, the one I got was when this deal had sort of changed over to 12 CDs. I think I got 12 CDs for a penny. I still remember, you know, being 13 years old and seeing this deal and it was too good to be true. Okay, so I had to jump on it. I don't even know how I sent them a pity, to be honest with you. I don't know if you dropped a pity in the envelope or how you did it. But, but uh, anyway, I mailed it off, and uh, I got my 12 CDs in the mail, and of course, I was, uh, I was pretty cool because uh, I had all the great new music to share with my friends. Well, um, what I, I was 13, so I didn't pay real close attention to the fine print. Um, you see, when you sent off 
to get the 12 CDs, there was a contract that you signed that you would buy, I think at this time, 16 CDs at full price over the next two years. Okay. Which in that day, uh, Jeremy, I can't remember the cost of CDs at the time, but it was around a 20 buck per CD you know, at full price. So uh, you have two years. Uh, anyway, the first letter I get that comes with my CDs reminds me that I've made this commitment. So I'm thinking, no problem. I got two years, right? Well, I still remember being 15 years old and receiving a letter from a collections agency <laughs> for the amount of $320 for the cost of 16 CDs that I had not yet covered throughout that contract. And I was hanging my head and I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I don't know what to do. I got myself in this mess. And I still remember him looking at me and he said, son, you didn't count the cost. You didn't count the cost. Uh, when I was dating Stacy, um, uh, this was 15 years ago now, it's hard to believe, but um, there's a road in, um, in Winfield, it's actually Hubbardville. If you try to look Hubbardville up, in the zip code, you won't find it because it doesn't have a zip code because it doesn't have a post office, but it is a place. It's just a really small place. Uh, Hubbardville, Alabama, there's a road called County Road 49. Wayne knows the road really well that Hubbardville School's on. And that's where my wife lives. She would live right next to Hubbardville School. So I would travel and uh, take her home on our dates, back and forth on our dates. And as we would travel down that road, just as soon as you turn off of, uh, off of the, the uh, main drag, <laughs> if you could call it that, between Winfield and Fayette, on the County Road 49 on the left side of the road, there was a house one day beginning to be built as we traveled. And so Stacy and I remarked, they were laying the foundation one day, and it was, it was a really nice, in, in our neck of the woods, when somebody's building a house, everybody knows it. Okay, it's not like up here, you know, there's about three houses a year built down there because you know the economy. So, so we're checking it out as we go by. And over the course of about a year, the foundation's laid, the framing goes up. And then one day we began to notice that the framing was where the house stopped. It began to be three, six, nine months later, and the house had stopped at the framing. And by that time, Wayne, you know what happens when you don't keep up a property? The weeds that had been cut back to build the house had become overtaking the property that was just being built. And as Stacy and I would drive back and forth, it was a constant mystery to us what was going on with the house. And everybody that lived and worked around County Road 49 talked about what is going on with this house. Who would start a house and not be able to finish it? I couldn't even fathom how you could do that because most of the time people would borrow the money for the full house to build it. Well, there's a story in the Bible um, where Jesus is talking about the importance of what my dad called counting the cost. Now, when Jesus is talking about it in Luke 14, when we read that story, his focus is not on what our focus is this morning. We're going to talk you know, briefly about, uh, about budget. His focus is on a, a more spiritual, a bigger counting of the cost. Now, I'd love to read the story for you. If you'd like to follow along with me, we'll be in uh, Luke 14. Uh, it will begin down in uh, verse 25, where large groups of people are walking along with Jesus. And I'm going to be reading from the message, but you're welcome to read from whatever version you uh, prefer. As large groups of people were walking along with him, Jesus turned and he told them, Anybody who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, 
Yes, even one's own self can't be my disciple. Anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me can't be my disciple. Is there anybody here who planning to build a new house doesn't first sit down and figure the cost? So you'll know if you can complete it. If you only get the foundation laid and then run out of money, you're going to look pretty foolish. Everyone passing by will poke fun at you. He started something he couldn't finish. Or can you imagine a king going into battle against another king without first deciding whether it is possible with his 10,000 troops to face the 20,000 troops of the other? And if he decides he can't, won't he send an emissary and work out a truce? Simply put, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, you cannot be my disciple. Now you may ask me, okay, well what does this have to do with budgeting? Uh, in other words, uh, why are you bringing this up? This is obviously a passage about discipleship and the things that we're supposed to give up, or at least be willing to give up in order to follow our Lord and Savior. Well, the reason why I bring it up is that the point that Jesus makes regarding making self-sacrificial decisions is based upon this idea of planning. And planning is a, budgeting is a function of planning. And that's what he says. Who doesn't count the cost before they spend it? And so I think it's important for us to realize that a major key to budgeting is the same as a major key to discipleship. And that's self-discipline. If you're going to be successful at making out a budget or making your money subject to you rather than you being subject to your money, then you have to be able to get this concept of self-sacrifice and discipline. And that's what I'm focusing my talk on today. Now I could spend my time, and, and uh, I think it's a good idea for you to know sort of the, the ins and outs of how do you uh, put you know, money in certain envelopes and use that system, or how you do this on a spreadsheet and those types of things. I think those are really important. But the reality with every encounter with budgeting that I've been a part of, is that the biggest problem is never how to write it down on a piece of paper. The biggest problem is always the emotional investment that happens with doing it and the difficulty that comes when you try to make decisions that are sacrificial regarding your money. It's been my experience in my short life that money is an emotional thing, okay? All right, and let me give you a few scenarios as to why I see it that way. If it's not an emotional thing, then tell me why marriages break up over it. Bill, do marriages break up over money? Yes, sir. If it's not an emotional thing, then tell me why do people hurt, kill, and injure each other over it? If it's not something that's emotional investment. If money's not an emotional thing, then tell me why it's a source of envy and jealousy in our lives. When we see people with it or with things that we desire or crave, why does it evoke a sensation within us to want what they have and to maybe even injure or hurt them for it? If money's not an emotional thing, tell me why families who otherwise love each other and take care of each other in this life, begin to fight ruthlessly over it when somebody dies. If money's not an emotional thing, why does the Bible say that it can be the root of all kinds of evil in our lives? So as you think about this idea of whether or not you should have a budget, 
I guess my encouragement to you is that um, you really need to see this not as a function of practicality, but as a function of your spirituality. Being able to get your money under control, I believe, is a spiritual discipline. And I know that may sound crazy, but if I believe that in my heart. Just like I believe planning is a function of our spiritual lives. And the reason why I believe that is because I've seen too many times, practically, this moral failure happen on lots of levels with people that I know and love very much and care about. And it's been very destructive in their lives and it hurts me to see that. And I don't want you to go through what I've seen some of my friends go through on this matter. I don't want you to go through some of the things I've gone through in dealing with money. So that's the reason why I want you to understand that I feel it's important for you to take it seriously now even if you haven't taken it seriously up to this point. Because I think it's hard to do better if you don't know to do better. And so I'm trying to share with you a way and a path that teaches you that it's okay to have messed up and it's okay now to start trying to do better with your money. It's also been my experience that money and moral failure, all right, everybody follow me on these two, that money and moral failure are the two most fireable offenses in ministry. Okay, did I communicate that? You guys know what I'm saying there? When I say fireable offenses, I mean that those are the two things that I have experienced with friends and loved ones that get you fired the quickest, okay? Um, I'm not sure, Bill, that money inches above moral failure, strangely. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to make a, a case for that. Anecdotally, um, it's just been my experience when a minister has trouble managing their money that it becomes a microcosm of distrust and lots of other things, and usually it's quick the elders are quick on a trigger to let someone go for it. Moral failure, uh, I have been really proud of a lot of our churches really trying to help ministers. But it seems like with money, again, I told you it's an emotional thing, that it's, it's a hard thing for people to, um, to get over um, whenever there are money problems in their ministry. Again, that's all anecdotal. I don't have any proof for any of that. That's just what I've experienced. So the thing I want, you know, really to emphasize to you today is the importance of redemption on this matter. So regardless of where you are with your money, okay, so you may not have been blessed. And again, I know we're recording this for MDiv students, so you may be a little older than, than some of the students in our audience. But you may not have been blessed with a mama and a daddy who made you work through these money issues as a young child. And they, they may not have prepared you because what I found now, just like this Columbia House thing, um, I got my first credit card in the mail before I went to college. They actually mailed me the card before I signed up for it. You know, you get, you get it in the, in the mail and then all you gotta do is activate it in order for it to be yours. Um, and so I don't know what your money situation is. I don't know how you're managing it now. But managing your money happens on every level. It happens on the personal individual level. And when you're in ministry, most of you will be given some sort of management uh, function over a budget at the church. So you may have a petty cash fund for the minister. You may have a book budget. You may have a a couple of ministries that you help to lead where you'll be given a church checkbook. Management happens at that, that level and then management happens at the overall church level. So budgeting is going to be a part of your life whether you mean for it to be or not. So it's good to now think about this redemptively and the ways in which you can, can do better. You remember that house 
that sat in a frame? Well, imagine my surprise this year on Mule Day, which I'll tell you about Mule Day sometime if you'd like to hear about it. Imagine my surprise on Mule Day when we were driving down County Road 49 and the house was finished 15 years later. Redemption in God is available at any time. And you always have the opportunity to do better. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. No matter where you are in your situation, find the tools and the resources you need and get help. Um, if you don't know how to do budgeting, if, if it's something that you don't know the particulars about, get help. People will help you with that, non-judgmentally, because they want you to be successful. And if you want me to help you, I'd be more than willing. Because an investment now that saves you in the future is well worth the cost. I think Jesus said that, right? Thanks.